Alright guys, first I've got a real bad sore throat, so forgive me if I'm a little soft. Second, this is a sauropod. Third, it's a titanosaur. And fourth, my favourite group are the sauropods, and my favourite subgroup within that are the titanosaurs. So this is going to be long and probably in two parts. So without further gilding the lily, let's get to it. The name Alamosaurus means Ojo Alamo Lizard, referring to the Ojo Alamo Formation of New Mexico. Like most titanosaurs, we're missing chunks of it. But unlike most titanosaurs, what we do have is comparatively good. And what we have suggests that this is one massive animal which reached sizes comparable to the likes of Argentinosaurus and Puertasaurus. For reference, this is the kind of size we're talking about. So let's address the elephant in the room. Or should I say the dwarf elephant? Many of us would love a 1 to 35 model. That of course would be very expensive. Previously giant animals like the Himalayasaurus and the Mamuncisaurus were given 1 to 45 scale by PNSO. So what's this Elamosaurus? For macronarians, we have to consider not just horizontal length but vertical height. For reasons I'll explain later, I prefer to take an estimate through the centre following the curve. And I believe that Tao Shuang Lao Shi has said that this is based on a true central length of 30 meters. I measured this at about 54 centimeters or 21 and a quarter inches, and that makes this model about 1 to 55. For completion, the horizontal length is about 40 centimeters or 15.7 inches, and the height 29 centimeters or 11.4 inches. I'll talk more about this in the science part of the video. But if 1 to 55 holds through, it's not just disappointing for a titanosaur, but introduces yet another scale to the line. So it won't scale with previous giants like Himalayasaurus or Mamuncisaurus. I know this will disappoint and even enrage many people. But for context, this is the size of the box. That's how much bigger than the model it is. In 1 to 35, or even 1 to 45, my western friends are going to suffer whether you're charged to ship by weight or volume. And if that's out of the way, we can look at this model on its own merits. First of all, the colour. In short, I really like it. Sure, it's earth tones again, but the tones chosen are so gentle and soothing to the eye and go with what I imagine is the nature of the beast. The pattern is also very nice. And it would have been a real letdown if PNSO had gone for the conservative idea for large animals, meaning dull, generally unpatterned, grey or brown. Now the details. First, let's be honest. When we talk about giant titanosaurs, most of them are so fragmentary that borrowing here and there leads to reconstructions along very similar lines. And save for certain anatomical minutiae, which you wouldn't see on a model, they all end up looking like clones, and you can call it anything you like. In terms of Elamosaurus, we do have an articulated neck and some postcranial material. This is actually a lot more than what we have for many titanosaurids. And a composite usually ends up looking like this one by Gunnar Bivens or this one by Dr. Scott Hartman. Now, the head. Frustratingly, the one part you almost never get with sauropods. The titanosaur skulls with decent remains are Nemectosaurus, another Nemectosaurid, Tapuyasaurus, Sarmientosaurus, and Rapetosaurus. Now, PNSO has taken reference from some of these, specifically Nemectosaurus, according to Cao Chuang. In addition, Tapuyasaurus and Nemectosaurus have been suggested to have beaks, which is a rather recent speculation for sauropods initially proposed by Wiersmer and Sander. You also see that here. And as with Zoo, PNSO took care not to give it cheeks. It's nice to also see nostril openings near the tip of the snout and not towards the head.
and then the neck here. Look at the almost ridiculous thickness of it, showcasing what's perhaps one of the freakiest aspects of these animals. And to populate all that real estate, look at all that wonderful detail. A PNSO is loved for its detailing, and you can see why. Our first in the head, and down the neck. I really like PNSO's trademark fineness of scalation, and especially how it's handled within each zone of colour. And also how it flows around the folds and creases. And all of it looks like real interacting soft tissue. And PNSO really keeps delivering detail like this that's satisfying without being over exaggerated. And then the torso. And just like in the neck, I feel this really captures the kind of volume, um, the kind of girth that I think of when I think titanosaur. And you can see from the top, from the front, very satisfying thickness again. And as we go over this, you'll see that in the same aesthetic, the detail is nicely realistic, with regional variety, and giving plenty of visual interest. Replete with scales and crisscrossed with folds and creases, there's a very organic look to the animal. Now most titanosaurs have been reconstructed with osteoderms or scutes, and in Alamosaurus in particular, it's a favourite choice to have this spike-like morphology, which doubtless makes it such a popular badass. And on the topic of osteoderms, I'll talk more in the science part of the video later. And down the dorsal midline, you can see an interesting row of different types of scalation. Look at how the tiny scales around that form up. But now see how around the scutes, the paint comes up a little, creating the appearance of subdermal osteoderms growing out of the skin. And even in this one for example, you can see this actually sculpted. And this little detail is so pleasing to me, as you realise that these scutes have a deeper origin, especially given the root and bulb morphology here. And now, the forelimbs. And going down the arm, we see yet more detail. And tracking down any sauropod fanatic wants to look at the hands. Now here's an interesting choice, the inclusion of a thumb claw. 
In general, derived titanosaurids are thought to have lost their thumb claw. PNSO, however, included it based on the fact that Diamantinosaurus actually has one. Now, whether this is because Diamantinosaurus retained it as a plesiomorphic feature should actually be considered a basal form, or simply as a result of geographic isolation is too much to speculate on and would make this video two hours. For what it's worth, I think we can just cut this off if it offends us. I'll also link to some thoughts on this by Nima Sasani below. And now, the hind limbs. Again, we can appreciate this for the detail. I will say, however, that in these claws here, especially given their size, it's unfortunately really simply painted, and I think more could have been done here. Now just a quick look at the underside. And the tail. In addition, it's interesting, but PNSO seems to have reverted to its previous bilingual version, which I like for language learning purposes. So there are now two separate books, English and Chinese. And this time, a real poster instead of just a photograph onto a photoshopped background. Very welcome indeed. And now some thoughts before we get to the comparisons. Scaling a Macronarian. It's always interesting trying to scale a Macronarian model because of the height. This is a dimension we seldom consider, but it's so impressive in Macronarians that it seems like an obvious measure to base a scale on. Of course, we could also go by horizontal length. But immediately you realise that depending on the neck posture, these two measures will fluctuate. We could take the femur, since it's what's most consistently preserved in titanosaurs, I choose not to do that for a few reasons. First, we don't have a complete femur, not even the keystone specimen TMM41541-1. And second, I can't say with certitude where the femur begins on this model. And thirdly, when companies produce a model, I don't think they base a scale by building on a femur. And this would also be meaningless since we don't know the exact proportions of everything else. And finally, to my simple and primitive mind, in terms of capturing an animal's length and volume, is just the least satisfying. Still, if we take the 1.9 meters suggested by the EMIC, and an estimate of 4 centimeters or 1.6 inches for our Alamosaurus femur, this model is about 1 to 48 scale. So perhaps we can take the through central length instead. Now, this would seem least affected by changes in neck attitude. And even then, every person would have to agree on the position of the centra, 
but I suspect the result would be less variable than going with the other two measures. Now, I've estimated 54 centimeters or 21 and a quarter inches for the through central length. Now, let's look at this schematic by Stevok86. And based on 54 centimeters, here's what I estimate for the through central length. The juvenile is about 7 meters, the middle one 15 meters, and the largest 26 meters. And incidentally, 26 meters is also the through central measure estimated by Molina Perez and Laramendi in their Sauropod book. Now, based off 54 centimeters, this is how our PNSO scales. For the juvenile, the scale is 1 to 17, the middle size 1 to 31, and for the largest, 1 to 48. So I guess you could consider this PNSO to be anywhere along this spectrum, which does encompass 1 to 35, the same way you could call a humanoid model almost anything by the same reasoning that humans can be 5 to 7 feet. But a 1 to 35 would represent a true size of 19 meters, which would just be too anticlimactic for most titanosaur lovers. Now here's another perspective. Assuming my 54 cm estimate, the scale would be 1 to 35 for 10.2 meters tall with a through central length of 18.9 meters, or around 19 meters. For 1 to 45, it would be 13.5 meters tall with a through central length of 24.3 meters. And for 155, it would be about 16 meters tall with a through central length of 29.7 meters, or approximately 30 meters. Now, I'm sure someone will have a different opinion, but this is a starting point for you. 